I want everyone standing up this first bit, actually. Come on, I want everyone up. Thanks. Okay, I'll stand up as well. Okay. Blessed be... No, no. Um, now, you're all here today because you care enough to find out what the nature of social problems are and what you can do to improve it, right? If that's you, say yes. Yes! Okay. Now, I want you to return to your seat if you sometimes become passive and hes hesitant when things get tough. When you keep putting things off, and putting things off, and putting things off. Yeah? You see, most people aren't extreme optimists. <laughs> Unlike these superhuman freaks right here. Okay. <laughs> My last talk dealt with a psychological resistance to taking action. And as it turns out, the problem isn't psychological. It's not just psychological, it's emotional and educational. We all have those moments, those opportunities to take action, or at least change our focus. We have these windows to take a new turning on the road of life. Z-Day is an example of such a turning. You're immersed for several hours here, and you can take that energy back with you after the event. It was like that for me. Back in 2010, I was relatively new to TZM and that uh, Z-Day was even a thing. You know, a few friends of mine said to me, yeah, you know, we're, we're going, we've never been before, we've got a spare seat in the car, if you want to come along? You know, I'm just like, okay. Um, but there was so, so much energy and enthusiasm in that car ride on the way home. Everyone would, uh, was saying that they would volunteer to give a talk like next year or the year after. But out of all the five of us, I'm the only one who stepped up. I was glad that I was the only one to take the baton and run. So where did the term learned helplessness come from? Back in 1967, psychologist Martin Seligman and Stephen Mayer uh, performed a series of experiments which placed dogs inside a shuttle box uh, with uh, the floor of one side electrified, as you can see. Essentially, the findings were in a two-tiered system where they would receive incon uh, incontrollable shocks or whether they could uh, stop the shocks by pressing a button with their head. And they were eventually put in the shuttle box, but the findings were that the dogs who received a shock became helpless and passive, whereas the dogs who didn't receive shocks could, upon the prompting of the sound of a buzzer or a light coming on, they would jump over to the other side because they knew that a shock was coming. Um, all dogs were as free to escape, however, it seemed the shocks were creating a, passive, a state of passive acceptance of the situation. However, as neuroscience and neural imaging has made significant progress since then, we've discovered the reality of what's going on is quite the opposite. Meet the dorsal raphe nucleus, part of the oldest structure of the brain called the brainstem. The particulars about this whole process are still elusive as we don't completely understand how the brain works. But what we do know, thanks to uh, Stephen Mayer's neurological studies, in the time since is that this part of the brain activates in the face of any prolonged stressor that we cannot control, creating a default state of passivity, sloth, and even stupidity. In fact, activation of the DRN is necessary and sufficient for producing helplessness. It is the default circuit which we click into in those circumstances. This means that helplessness isn't learned, but rather activated. Helplessness is not induced but rather a result of failing to learn control. So how is helplessness resolved and control learned? This is where a much newer part of the brain comes in. Meet the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Activation of this part of the brain is necessary and sufficient in deactivating the DRN and thus overriding the state of helplessness. This is the seat of our resistance and the struggle to empower the self against a disempowering force. It's a matter of how persistent and armed our brain is. The VMPFC activates and engages in a shutdown of the DRN, pacifying it. It is sometimes a lengthy struggle. However, with enough tenacity, the lower part of the brain is ridden down into inactivity. <laughs> the brainstem perceives reality at a low, much lower resolution, meaning that it is a far less articulated mode of perceiving. 
uh, and responding to the environment in basic functioning. A threat to the self, regardless of the category or degree, is still just a threat. It's a far simplistic way of looking at things. This is why a conscious process, armed with articulated positive understandings, such as how a stressor can be controllable, is required to soothe the state of hopelessness. This is what Martin Seligman called learned optimism. In his book of the same title, Dr. Seligman summarizes, emotions and actions don't usually follow from the adver directly from adversity. They come instead from our beliefs about adversity. So when you change your mental response to adversity, you can cope with setbacks much better. When I first had the idea of creating this presentation to further expand on what is holding us back as activists, I began to see how the sheer number and degree of complexity to our stresses gives rise to a societal scale of learned helplessness. And that's all before the additional stresses inherent to the kind of activism we engage in. So considering that helplessness isn't learned, one thing that is learned is optimism. So it takes awareness and mindfulness to see things for how they actually are, and not just how it feels, which we, uh, sorry, uh, depending on which of these stresses we can control and which we cannot, we can start learning how much control we potentially wield. Apathy is a popular and pervasive social norm. It's an easy way of dealing with problems, and it has the benefit of creating a bubble of distractions to reassure you that everything is okay. Whilst this principle of selective focus, valuing positivity over negativity, is a great thing and essential to healthy thinking, it needs to be informed by actual feedback from the real world and the maturity to sort through it. Otherwise, it exhibits as a delusional contentment which can become blind to the problems surrounding them. Their eyes are sometimes wide, but not seeing anything, hence the term eyes wide shut. Doubling down into willful ignorance is easy. The brain filters information that is important at that point in time. However, when this filter becomes too strict on a complex issue, we deal with this choice of perception. Nuance versus polarization. There is a tendency in our thinking to take a pass on the effort to understand compl something complex. If it's possible to get a simple black or white explanation for something, hell, it's more efficient. And that's fine if it's a simple idea. However, when you're dealing with complexity, or to use a computer analysis analogy, a higher resolution image, viewing that image at a much lower resolution blocks you from being able to see let alone appreciate the detail, which is then the seat of understanding. When polarized thought is applied to our current political system, which the media inherently and loves to funnel down by selective coverage to a choice of eventually two candidates, this way of being has people absentmindedly supporting and voting for political candidates, partly because in this culture, they are only presented with a binary choice. And that's convenient if it saves people having to understand much. All the better. But what is lost here then is the shades of gray that permeate everything. Reality isn't black and white. It's more of a gray scale. Not that kind of gray scale. Um, this kind of gray scale. The problem of polarized thought should be clear enough to anyone who deals with a contentious topic. For instance, the train of thought TZM advocates in its entirety is a multifaceted collection of information and value identifications that cannot be sufficiently understood if you're taking a black or white approach to thought. And when you're talking to someone who's unfamiliar with it, an additional layer of nuance can materialize because you are speaking of a social paradigm that they have no reference for and thus all the projections and preconceptions that culture teaches about how any supposedly better society or egalitarian society may need to be dealt with first. In other words, sometimes we need to address what an NLRBE isn't before we can actually address what it could be. Dr. Seligman is also known for creating the PERMA model, which he designed to measure and promote the actions and values necessary for well-being. P is for positive emotion, the experience of having chosen to focus more on positivity, the more obvious element that pertains to optimism. While this emotional experience can be said to be pleasurable, there is a distinction between pleasure and enjoyment. 
Pleasure is almost automatic with the meeting of bodily needs. Uh, so it's good, but it doesn't last. Uh, so it's unhealthy to use as a long-term strategy. Whereas enjoyment is the positive emotional experience of intellectual or creative engagement and creating a positive existence in some shapeable form. The joy of doing things for the sake of doing it is an example. Moving on to E for engagement, the process of actively applying attention and being present while doing so. This, ladies and gents, is the incentive system of an NLRBE. Say hello. Uh, passivity and non-creation begins to torture the self after a while. The, the, the lack of this aspect is being felt. We as humans need to be engaged in something. We've just been duped into thinking that engagement has to be a job. <laughs> so how are you engaged with life? This is seen in skill building and mastery. It's where learning and stretching occurs. When people feel energized to get involved in something, and they find a groove or a niche which they build momentum in and thrive in, what activities do you regularly enter a flow state while doing? What gets you from stuck in your head and out of the moment to a state of in the moment and out of your head? So, moving on to R, R is for relationships, to experience genuine reciprocal connections and support with other humans. Relationships come in all shapes and sizes, children. <laughs> Do you feel connected to any people in your life? Human beings, as we are beginning to recognize and thus say more, are social creatures which require some level of contact and interaction between the self and other humans to thrive. Even introverts require social interaction. The problems come in this, uh, when this need isn't being met and thus dysfunction follows. So what is the quality of your social connections? Do you have common ground, reciprocity or trust? Whose back do you have? And who's, who, whose back has yours? Yeah, who has yours? <laughs> <laughs> Felt like George Bush in that, fool me once. <laughs> M is for meaning. Possibly one of the main reasons why you came here today, right? To ensure your life serves a higher purpose than just the meeting of your needs. If engagement is the arrow's velocity, then meaning is the target. We want to know that our life amounted to something, that it had some impact. In a way, the need for meaning is an expression of selflessness, because you advocate a better world such as we do, Despite knowing that it's unlikely to benefit you personally, you do it anyway. If that is selfless. To pursue meaning is how we finite beings can extend the reach of our actions while alive. Our influence need not die with us if we seek to create a work that survives us. And A is for accomplishment. Along the road to personal growth are signposts that not only mark how far you've come, but mark the different kinds of territory that you've traversed already. Uh, when, when time and effort are devoted to the building of a skill, completing of a task or learning information or behavior, the process is enabled by the preset milestones of achievements. The psychological effect of creating goals for achieving is not only motivating, but also enriching when you make the achievements along the way to accomplishing your goals. It gives us a sense of pride and fulfillment, or as Tony Robbins said, happiness equals progress. A sedentary way of being roots a person in place. You're rooted in comfort, and motion requires portability in a sense. Say you spend a considerable amount of time not going anywhere, or not really doing much, or merely engaged in the same daily activity with little to no variety. Your roots are now deep. How are you going to go from that to moving? I experienced this very phenomena in the transition from my previous job to my current one. I was stuck in a place uh, and, in, and a very low income that I didn't want to be in, and so much time had passed that I began to feel helpless uh, and powerless in my attempts to find a better situation. What I didn't anticipate when I finally landed a better opportunity is how reaching out for it and taking on its momentum Thor's hammer, it actually began to hurt. 
it hurt because I did, delayed the work of digging around my root structure to free up what's coming with me and what's being left behind. I was caught in a tug of war between comfort and growth, but suffering in indecision. When you're being pulled in two opposing directions, you have to take one of them fully. You have to commit before you become too afraid. Creating a better future is actually also kind of similar to leaving a building by means of a revolving door. We're on our way out. We can see what, what it looks like outside. And when we're in the revolving door, there are three options. One, uh, step, on, step out on the outside. Uh, two, step back into the lobby. Or what a lot of people do to our amusement is get stuck in the revolving door and go round and round and round while waiting for the opportunity to either exit or return. And it's also a matter of timing, you see. You need to act at the right moment, otherwise you'll be sent back round again. Sometimes you need to know if your friends are out there waiting for you. After all, we're social creatures. So as social activists, we need to be social with one another. Be there when we need each other. Be there on the other side so we can do great things together. Sure, it's comfy and social in the lobby, <laughs> because a lot of people are either coming and going, or also either waiting to take action. Nothing and no one is going to take the, make the actual moves of your right action besides you. Sure, other people can influence it, they can stoke it or even extinguish it, but the trigger is in your hand. How many times do you pull the trigger on the starting pistol of your own life? In a book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, Dr. Susan Jeffers says, with each risk you take, each time you move out of what feels comfortable, you become more powerful. Your whole life expands to take in more of what it, what it is in the world to experience. As your power builds, so does your confidence, so that stretching your comfort zone becomes easier and easier. And since this book was a major influence on this talk, I've paraphrased the five truths of fear that she lists in the book. Truth number one, the fear is part and parcel with continued growth. What this means is whenever you're growing, it's gonna be scary. The paths most trodden are worn right down to the ground, so it's easy to follow. But those paths only lead where everyone else goes anyway. It's where everyone has been before. To make changes, you need to be a trailblazer to a certain extent. You've got to take taller strides and find your footing for yourself. But Adam, I can't see the ground for the undergrowth. What, I get, what if I get bitten by a snake? That kind of... Pessimism is understandable to a certain degree, and as we've discussed, it's sometimes inevitable. Of course, you're going to also face resistance in the environment because you're literally clearing a new path. And you will learn to be okay with the changes you make. Unless, like, you're imposing on the world through your changes. Tell you what, hands up, how many people react to fear in general by becoming passive? Okay, hands up, how many people react by becoming proactive? Yeah, it's okay to put up your hand up for both of those because we're all in a transition. Truth number two, the only way to diminish your fear of something is to face it. What this means is, whether it's a new job, a new routine, a new way of thinking even, it's full of uncertainty. And as a result, you feel fear. But just like the immune system, we build our preparedness to those situations by putting themselves into them anyway and surviving. As you take right action, you will begin learning, doing, internalizing, and then mastering the necessary steps to complete the new behavioral or thought pattern. You must begin to exert volitional control in order for you to feel less fearful. When you're, talk when you're taking right, ac right action, you will eventually become focused on the process of getting done what needs to be done, instead of psychologically and emotionally whining about how much it sucks to be doing it. Truth number three, the process of gaining momentum and overcoming fear is a source of happiness. 
What this means is there is a certain feeling of aliveness when you're engaging in action to manifest your goals and move forward. This is what Mihai Csikszentmihalyi talks about in his book, Flow, a state of optimum functioning. There's a surge of energy because you're building momentum and it feels good. You're taking control of your life by means of your conscious decisions. It's easy to feel good about yourself if you're on your path and you're directing things because that which is bothering you falls to the side. Truth number four. No one is immune from fear, so you might as well be courageous. What this means is fear is a natural human emotion. It is not something to be ashamed of. However, it is something which needs to be recognized and used as a signal to take action. Or as I said in my last presentation last year, it's a spidey sense, you know. When faced with a moment of stress, would you rather be passive or fearful, or would you rather be proactive and create courageous? This is the difference between living and merely existing. Courage is universally beneficial and valuable. Courage, uh, sorry, in, it's the reason why heroes are the protagonists of their respective stories, because they aspire to the courage to make that ultimate sacrifice at the required moment. And each time you let a little of that fear go, or you do the greater thing, or you aspire to a higher value system, you are being heroic. You are making the great sacrifice to ignore the little me in favor of the greater us. And truth number five, the level of fear inherent to taking action is far lower than actually living in helplessness. What this means is that the fear you fear, uh, the the fear you feel, sorry, when taking action is a construct of your own mind. You build up this worst case scenario in your head, which exceeds the level of fear you're generally used to. However, what we need to recognize is that while that fear may seem intense and endless, no, it's only temporary, just as all psychological states are. And it begins to fade after you take that, those first steps. If you opt for being passive, then you will experience a baseline of fear, which cumulatively far outweighs the fear of taking action in the moment, not just in intensity, but in duration. I'm going to address one more issue here before we uh, wrap up with an exercise. When you're resolving personal issues, growing as a person, and actively making the effort to create and inspire change, and, return, uh, and the return on investment is low or minus for you, you may begin to ask, what's the point? You know, how, how can I feel happy when activism is such a struggle? It's thankless sometimes, to the extreme of being taboo and even heretical. It's stressful and it alienates you from society to an extent. Kind of hard to be a social movement if we feel alienated from society or vice versa. Changing the direction of an NLRBE can come from the internalization and thus inspiration to others. So what can sustain you despite the tide you are marching forward against? Well, along with the PERMA model that I described earlier, this is also where visualization comes in. So let's do this now. I want everyone to sit up straight in their chairs, shoulders back, and close your eyes. Now I want you to start fleshing out an image of who you aspire to be. I want you to imagine like, how they would hold themselves. What kind of look would they have? Would they be very confident? Would they have made achievements? What is their outlook on life? Really create detail. The more detail, the better. This exercise is like archery. The better you have a view of your target, the more likely you are to hit it. Flesh this image out with even more detail. This is who you want to become. Feel how they would be feeling. Really make this image vivid. Now everyone close, open your eyes. Still feel that? That's powerful, right? Notice that you can actually borrow confidence from your future self. As long as you're on the path to creating that person, you deserve some of the confidence that your future self has. Now, of course, you shouldn't punish yourself when you stray from your path, and believe me, you will. Uh, 
so, but just take the strain as a learning experience. And to be good to yourself and remind yourself where the path is. Make a habit of doing things that your future self will thank you for. Now everyone that wants to make their future selves proud, say yes! Yes! yes. So let's do it. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much.